So in uh, last week's lecture, we talked a little bit about the English lexicon project. And I said we would come back to it. And now we're going to kind of come back to that and look more into frequencies and response latencies. Um, so I kind of last week told you to hold those thoughts and now let us get into them. So specifically, we're going to talk more about ELP and the English Lexicon Project and why it's so fantastic. Uh, the subtitle projects as a complement to ELP. The extension into priming projects, which is a little bit of the work that I am doing. And then um, applying linear regression to those projects. So the goal today is to learn about the corpora and suggest, uh, subjective measures that are available um, that people don't often talk about uh, and extend regression into that. So the English Lexicon Project can be found here at WashU's website. God bless it, it's kind of ugly, but it is really handy. Uh, from that, what they want you to do with their website is to generate lists of words with um, maybe specific numbers that you're interested in. And this is really used for experimental design. So if I am trying to show participants a word list that I know have um, specific characteristics, like are only two syllables long and are less than six characters, etc., I can use their website to generate that. You can also download the, all of the data. So that's really nice. Um, go back over here. What it was was a really big uh, lab project. Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, no, that's acting weird. One second. Thanks. Okay, now it should be fixed. Um, so what the English Lexicon Project was is a bunch of labs got together and said, you know what? We're doing all this behavioral research. We really need a standardized set of tools to use. And that's kind of the theme of the lecture today is this, um, not renovation, that's not the right word, revolution, there we go, <laughs> of, of using uh, standardized word sets in psycholinguistics literature. And this was not the first word set, nor will it be the last, but it was definitely one of the most important ones and started this trend towards creating these types of data. And I would argue probably one of the most important ones is the next one we're going to talk about here. So corpora have been around for a long time, um, but now with the availability of the internet, uh, I just remembered, I'm really bad. I've been bad the last like three lectures at not turning this off. Okay, good. And like in the middle of it, you'll get a text message from my husband who's telling me he's coming home. <laughs> so I managed to remember today. All right. Um, so corporate have been around for a while, and so have these databases. But in the last 10 years alone, this field has grown exponentially. So you can look at the trends in um, publishing corpora or mega data studies, and this is just um, increasing rapidly partially because of the availability of the internet, websites like Mechanical Turk where you can collect cheap and easy data. Um, so it's just easier to do now as well. Um, wrong button. And so the data set for eLexicon is 40 real words and 40, I'm sorry, 40,000 real words and 40,000 fake words across many linguistic characteristics. What they did was they had participants perform a lexical decision and a naming task. Um, and then they've given us all of the data from those trials. And so let's get into what a lexical decision task looks like. If this will work today, there are days when it doesn't work. Okay. So I'm going to take this uh, little tiny experiment. Okay. And it tells me that in a lexical decision task, I'm going to see two words. Oh, it's still acting wonky. Hold on. That's all you typing. <laughs> there, that should have fixed it. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a day. Moodle is apparently having a day because I was entering grades earlier and it just was moving slow as it gets. So just let me know when it freaks out again. <laughs> 
looks like it's okay right now. Anyways, so a lexical decision task, we're going to see two words at a time. Generally, actually, you only see one. In this example, there's two. If it's a real English word, I'm going to hit the A key. If it's not, I'm going to hit the L key. Okay, so I've got doctor, nurse, those are real words. Tree, doctor, those are real words. Whoops. I didn't like that. The fake word. Fake word. Okay, real words. Fake words. Real, oops. Ah. <laughs> These tasks are um, sometimes not easy. So one fake word, both real words. And then it gives me my answer. So I'm going to hold, hold this slide. We're um, going to hang on to it. <laughs> Come back to it in a minute. Okay. And so what a lexical decision task is, is normally you see one word at a time. In this particular example, you see two, and we'll talk about why in a second. Um, and you just decide, is it a real word or a fake word? And so you do exactly what I just did, and people make mistakes like I just did, and when they're doing it, they also like, oh, you can tell when they make a mistake because they have this kind of visceral reaction. Um, but either way, it's very simple. Word, not word. Word, not word. And a naming task is even easier. You just read. So they set you up with a microphone, and you see the word on the screen. You say, doctor, nurse, tree. Um, so the fake words are funny because people are never sure how to pronounce them. So um, that's an interesting question, too, about phoneme production. And what we're interested in is looking at what might predict that response latency. So I'm going to call this response latency because this is how long it takes someone to make a decision and respond. Sometimes people use reaction time. And the real split, um, the, one, the, the moment when someone explained it to me that I was like, ah, I get it. Reaction times are uh, generally in cognitive literature considered um, immediate. So these are things when you hear a loud bang, you turn your head, there's no real decision to be made. A response latency is when you are looking at something and you have to make a decision, yes a word, no not a word, and then you have to plan that decision. So I've got to literally say the word aloud or make a response on the keyboard. Okay. Uh, that distinction is slight, but it, it implies different levels of cognitive processing. So we're going to call them response latencies, but you'll see people call them reaction times. That's the main distinction. And so can we use lexical, like lexical variables, length, frequency, et cetera, to predict those response latencies? And that's the goal of today's lecture. Can we? So in come the subtitle projects. Uh, to me, this is the turning point. Uh, I mean, the, the field is not that old. And obviously, I can be wrong, but I think this is, to me, a, a big turning point in corpus linguistics um, for kind of the modern era because it really changed a lot of what we were doing. Um, and so this started with Breisbert and New, and they wrote several papers on it. And then Mark Breisbert also um, had some money from somewhere. <laughs> and... Um, so you know what, we really need to rethink this frequency thing okay. and its relationship to linguistic literature. Um, so forever in a thousand years, two sources of frequency were used. So when we're predicting or we're trying to control our variables or when we're just trying to understand language, frequency is a huge predictor. If you don't know the answer, guess frequency. Okay. It is the number one predictor usually. But we were using the brown corpus from Cousier and Francis. In my other class, I talk about how this is the most overused corpus, um, myself included. And where we were using it, people are still using it today. Okay. So 1967, that makes that sucker 52 years old. Okay. So do we really think language frequency, except for maybe stop words, is the same from 52 years ago? Probably not, right? Um, and the, the limitation to the brown corpus is that it was mostly scientific literature and uh, science fiction and hobbies and like a very special set of like um, written texts. 
and obviously we don't write and speak in the same way, so what kind of frequency are we representing? The other big corpus that people like to use is the How Corpus from Burgess and Livesay. Um, and that one's newer and more popular. There's also the TASA Corpus that LSA uses that we'll talk about later this semester. But there were traditionally sort of only two. And I say we, the, glo the global we. Bryce Burt and New were, were not really sure that these were the best ways to estimate frequency. And how much better can we predict our variables if we have a better measure of frequency? So it's a methods question. And so what they did across many languages now, oh, sweet, the website just changed. <laughs> um, Let's see if Lexique is open today. Awesome. Oh, they switched to a shiny app. Ah, <laughs> this literally changed from six weeks ago when I taught this the first time. And I'm like, glorious, it's an R. Anyway, <laughs> so here's some proof that people are using R in our field. All right, so uh, amazing. On the side here, you can now pick, instead of going to six different websites for every different language, they now have um, uh, the different languages available over here on the side. We're going to pick subtitle, um, subtitles in the United States for English. Um, and then I've got some explanations here, but you can see the entire data set. Look at this shiny app. Check it out. I'm uh, sorry, this just amuses me so much. Uh, so what it has is it has the words, the frequency of those words. Uh, frequency in CDs. Uh, frequency in subtitles and uh, the lo log version of those. So they took, I don't even remember how many, do I have it on here? Something about um, 400 million, no 50 million words or more from opensubtitles.org which is a website that has um, music lyrics and movie su movie subtitles because this is a much better representation of well subtitles anyway um, spoken speech and hence the name the subtitles projects and then they estimated the frequency of words for uh, in subtitles and in music lyrics and using some predictive modeling showed that Predicting almost everything, but especially lexical decision and naming times are much better with these subtitle frequencies than with the previous frequencies. So. Right. And they have expanded this to 15 or 20 languages now all on one page. Woo! That makes me happy. <clears throat> Another but related project is the semantic priming project, and I was part of this one. So priming is, a, is an event that happens in the brain when your cognitive processing is speeded because of some previous event. So if I see doctor the, and the second word is nurse, I'm going to be much faster at reading nurse because of priming, because doctor made me think of nurse. So we can measure priming with these lexical decision tasks by showing related word pairs. Um, unrelated word pairs do not get the prime. I feel like you just need to start typing. <laughs> I'll see. There we go. Hopefully that fixed it. Uh, generally, my time priming. Okay. All right. So priming and naming tasks. So if I have you in order, say doctor, then nurse, you'll read the second one faster. So. If I have doctor then tree, these are unrelated words. Tree is slow, is normal speed. If I have doctor then nurse, nurse is faster than if I did tree to nurse. So in relation to a related trial, or compare it to it itself, um, related words are faster. Okay, that's what priming is. And the idea here is that um, the, there's several different mechanisms to priming. Uh, but the most common explanation is spreading activation. And we'll actually do this model, this Collins and uh, Loftus model later in this semester. But the, and it's really tiny, but the idea here is that once you get this word here in the middle, fire engine, 
It's like water spilling down a hill. It spreads out to all of the related words. This is why the game of telephone happens, right? So if I tell you this story and it changes a little bit, it changes a little bit, it kind of spreads, right? Or the gossip, if you will. Um, and then uh, spreading activation can also be purposeful where you're like expecting the next word to be related. But without understanding the English lexicon project of how fast words normally are, and without understanding frequency from the subtitle project, this semantic priming project would be very difficult because we wouldn't know how to predict priming um, without those databases. I will tell you based on some work that we are currently cursing at, um, we still don't know how to predict priming, but we at least know that we have some good variables to start with. Um, and so the project itself, if you want to use this for your final project, um, is has lexical decision and naming response latencies um, for related word pairs, unrelated word pairs, and fake word pairs. It is tied with the uh, English lexicon and subtitle project, so all of the data is in one place. And that just gives us even more data to predict response latencies or priming latencies. And so priming latencies is something that we worked on for the last conference we went to and it didn't really work. And so if you can find a way to make it work, that would be awesome. Um, and so it's something that our, my research team is thinking about. And so what we did was regression. So let's talk about predicting, uh, predicting variables. So simple regression is when we have uh, one independent variable and one dependent variable. This is the same thing as correlation. Multiple regression is when I have lots of independent variables, two or more, and one dependent variable. And multiple regression is pretty useful because I mean, this is like the underpinning to so many things. So some machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, ANOVA. <laughs> like, Regression is kind of the, the, the math that holds a lot of things up, right? Um, because it really allows me to look at the predictive ability of each variable adjusting for others. So frequency is great. How much does, um, does, let's say, word length add to it after frequency? So I can tell about them in a, um, not codependent, um, when they control for each other, rather than just looking at each one one at a time with correlation. So we can fit linear models is what we're going to work on this week. In a couple of weeks, we'll do nonlinear models. Um, so it kind of depends on if we expect this to be linear or not. The moment we expect this data to be linear, response latency is generally a linear combination of variables. Um, and so the choice of parametric or non-parametric de depends on this expectation of linearity. And a little bit about normality and the type of variable, but mostly about linearity. So, let's say I am trying to predict, we're going to use Y here as on response latency. Okay. So Y, or Y hat, is the predicted score for each person. Each person is labeled with an I, so one, two, three, four, on the dependent variable. Now my dependent variables aren't people here, they're words, but this would be the, the response latency for cat, response latency for cheese, etc. B sub zero is the y-intercept, so this is the average of y um, when all of the x variables are zero. B1, B2, etc. are our slope values for each predictor. So this is the increasing or decreasing effect for each x variable. And so slopes are interpreted as for every one unit increase in x, B unit increases in y. Or if it's negative, for every one unit increase in x, we get B decreases in y. Okay, so they're either going up together or one's going up and the other one's going down. X is each individual predictor, one at a time, and the dot 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 here represents multiple more predictors. 
And then E out here, or epsilon, is the error for each person, because we never get the score exactly right. Okay. So if you add up all of these individual contributions to response latency, there's always just a little bit that we're off. And we want the little bit that we're off to be a random factor, basically, and we'll get into checking assumptions towards the end. But this is essentially the difference between their predicted score and their actual score. So I just tried to represent that here. So we're using least squares estimation, nothing fancy. It's a closed form solution, meaning that there's one answer only, unlike some iterative um, algorithms that have uh, multiple solutions, like maximum likelihood is an iterative algorithm that um, is not closed form. And so we find the best fit or the best model by estimating a slope such that the errors are the smallest they can be. Okay, hence why it's called least squares and it's called squares because the whole thing is squared because it's about variance. And so we're trying to minimize the distance between their actual score and their predicted score. And we won't get into the math because that's what computers are for, but we'll talk about um, the interpretation, understanding the output, because I, I love computing. I love computers. They do a lot of the magic math for me. I mean, I understand the math, but I don't see the point in doing things by hand. That's why we have these machines. So, so for me, the, what you'll see on the homework especially is making sure you understand the interpretation of what's happening. Okay. So for heaven's sakes, don't say that something is more significant because I saw that yeah, uh, when I was grading, not y'all's class, a different class, and I was like, ah, okay, so don't say that. Um, <clears throat> so what would I interpret instead? Right. So when I look at my overall model, this is all of the variables I have put into my regression equation. I can determine statistical significance by using p-values. A lot of people use less than 0.05 for better or worse, and that's a different um, rant on a different day for why that's problematic. Um, but it's an f-test, and we can determine if it's statistically significant. Um, but uh, I have a, a distinct focus on practical significance. Because, especially for a lot of you business people, like a lot of you are working in industry, and statistical significance seems to have this like sort of magic, like everyone thinks it's so important, but it, it may not be practically useful. So I always want to make sure people present both, where something with like lots of data points may be statistically significant, but totally useless. So we'll also determine practical significance by using R squared. And R squared is a representation of how much variance I've accounted for in the dependent variable with the independent variable. <clears throat> All right, for our individual predictors, drilling down now into the equation, we can look at statistical significance by using T, the t-test. This t-test determines if the slope value is different from zero because zero would imply that it's not predictive. Practical significance we can do with partial correlations. So what partial correlation tells me how much variance the predictor is accounting for after controlling for everything else. So let's jump in. We are going to use the Arling library and the ELP data again today. Uh, the word column is the word presented to the uh, participant, so rackets, stepmothers, delineated swimmers. I do not remember where they got this list from, but it's got some bonkers words in it. Okay. Length is the number of characters in each word. Okay. Subtitle word frequency is the subtitle project we just talked about, and that's parts per million. Um, uh, POS is part of speech, and mean RT is response latency in milliseconds. So I can look at how long delineated takes to um, name linguistically, and it's nine, almost a whole second. Um, now, one thing that we have in our data set is a categorical predictor. 
And I like to talk about this because dummy coded predictors can be difficult to understand sometimes. And so when X is continuous, the interpretation is the same one we just talked about. For every one unit increase in X, we get B unit increases in Y. But that doesn't make sense in a categorical way. So for every one unit increase in x, I go from noun to verbs. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, instead, we're going to use dummy coding, and R will do it for you, which was one of the most glorious things to learn when I switched from SPSS to R because hallelujah, right? It just does it for me. <clears throat> and so, oh, why does this look crazy? This looks crazy. Let's go look at it in here. There's our, there's our table. That looks less crazy. So dummy coding is a way to represent categorical data in a least squares analysis. So this is the way ANOVA actually works. Okay. So let me make sure that's still projecting correctly. Good. Um, you get categories minus one. So this particular example is from Andy Field's book, um, and it has four categories, affiliation, an indie kid, a metalhead or a crusty old <laughs> music listener. So most of his examples are about music. And if I have four category levels, I will get three predictors. Okay, so dummy variable one, two, and three. And what happens uh, internally uh, that R does for us is that it automatically creates um, Kind of like barcodes for the variables is the way I think about it. It's actually binary, but barcodes hopefully will resonate with you guys. Wherein uh, one of the variables is the control group okay, or the comparison group. And that's usually the first one alphabetically in R. In this example, it's the no affiliation group because it has um, all zeros across here. Interpreting a predictor with this scheme is that the, it's the difference in means between a coded group and the control group. So dummy variable one here is crusty versus no affiliation. Two is metal versus no affiliation. Three is indie kid versus no affiliation. If you wanted to know metal versus crusty, you'd have to refactor the variable and change the order. So it just like out of nowhere started pouring. That's good. So part of speech in our analysis is our categorical predictor. It has three categories, JJ for adjective, NN for noun, and VB for verb. There are other words, obviously, but this data set only has those. And the default is to make the first category the comparison category. Okay, that's not really what I want here because that would compare adjectives to verbs. And if we think about the language, adjectives are noun modifiers, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to compare them to verbs. Instead, what we want to do is compare nouns to adjectives and nouns to verbs. So to do that, I would rearrange to make nouns the first category. What I mean by first is it shows up here on the left. It's the one that R thinks is the first group. So I'm going to use the factor command, if you haven't seen this. So it's data set um, with the column name. Then you tell it what the levels are in the data. So you have to use the ones from the actual data. If you do something else here, you'll wipe them out. Okay, I'm going to have to start over. So I've got my actual levels from the data, and then the labels that I want to give those. So I'm going to reorder to put nouns first and give them better labels. So I don't have to remember that JJ is an adjective. It's more like you guys don't. It's normal to me, but that would be odd to people who have never seen that before. Now, the second issue, so we've dealt with categorical data. Big issue number two is that linguistic data is almost never normal. So we've got these assumptions for parametric statistics that require normality. It doesn't tend to happen. Um, so, especially when we're working with frequency, 
frequency is distributed by Zipf's law that we talked about last week. So that's definitely not normal. It's distributed in a power curve. And so if I look at a histogram of the word frequencies, I think this actually matches the questions you guys were asking about last week about how it's so tall and skinny that you can't really tell what's happening in the graph. So we have that same problem today. Um, clearly not normal. So what's the solution? Well, thankfully it's an easy solution. We're gonna take the log of that variable. So taking the log um, essentially pulls in the tail and sort of flattens the distribution. Uh, so some of them become negative, which is a little odd, but um, it does solve our non-normality problem pretty nicely. This is pretty common in this field. The only caveat I have is that makes interpretation a bit more difficult because the for every one unit increase in x is now a logistic variable. So for every one log unit in x, we get b units in y. It's a little awkward, but you know it helps um, normalize a very skewed data uh, distribution. So if I just take the log of this, you can see this is much better. Um, and effectively, what we see is there are some words that are kind of, you can also scale the data that sometimes solves the problem using z-scores. In a heavily skewed distribution, log is one of, only, your, one of your only answers before you switch to non-parametric statistics. Um, <clears throat> so it's better. Okay, so we're going to use that instead of using the data as is. So let's build our model. So I'm going to save it as model, because why not? You can call it whatever you want. Um, I just happen to like the word model. Sometimes I save them as annoying step one, annoying step two. It depends on how I feel that day. So the format for our LM function is y dv first tilde for is estimated by and then add all of your x variables together. So be sure you're doing adding. Don't put a comma or the whole thing will blow up. Okay. So we're gonna predict response latency with length, uh, frequency, and part of speech. A nice simple model, how long the words are, how um, frequent they are, and what part of speech they are. And this model, hopefully, um, if you think about English, Anyway, uh, this should make some sense because um, the biggest predictor of how fast we read, if you think about reading physically, word length, obviously longer words should take uh, longer to read. More frequent words are recognized faster. And maybe um, verbs are a little faster. There's less of those. But we'll see. Oh, and then you throw in the name of the data frame. So I'm gonna summarize that. And since this doesn't really fit, you could be looking at this in the markdown, um, but we're gonna talk about each piece one at a time and I'll just show you each little piece one step at a time. Um, but if I'm doing this analysis on my own or I'm not doing it on slides, I would just look at this whole thing. Okay. Um, so it's one of the bad things about slides sometimes is the, the outputs don't fit. So your summary of the model to see everything I'm about to talk about, but I could first look at the residuals. The residuals, remember those little E components. It's the error in our in our model. And it's how far we are, how bad we are at predicting response latency. So on some of them we're missing too low, on some of them we're missing too high. Uh, you want the mean of your errors to be zero. Okay. And we'd want these to be normally distributed. So one of the assumptions is that the, the residuals, will the data be normally multivariate, normally distributed, but we can kind of look at that by looking at the residuals. Uh, we want this to be linear and homoscedastic. So at the end, after I talk about these predictors, we'll talk about how I check for those things. There are lots of ways to do it. I'm just going to show you um, a little bit of what the book has and a little bit of my favorite flavor. And we're going to use those residuals for diagnosticity in a little bit. So first, the coefficients. 
A coefficients table tells me each individual predictor's significance levels one at a time. So notice this does not say practical importance. We're going to have to do that ourselves. If I want to use p less than 0.05 as a criterion, what we find in this analysis is that the intercept is our average response latency. So I can tell how fast words are in general. And I know it's more than zero seconds because, duh. Um, length is a positive predictor. Longer words take longer to read. Okay. Um, no big shock there. Frequency is a negative predictor, meaning that as the word becomes more frequent, they are read faster or judged faster. So a low frequency word takes longer to recognize. And then adjectives and nouns are the same response latency and verbs and nouns are different response latencies. And we can see that by looking at our coefficients table. I do recommend turning off scientific notation if you have a hard time reading it. I find, like I can read it, but it gives me a headache. So I always turn it off just so I can get um, the, the real P values and not the E values. So what I was just saying, length, positive, um, frequency, negative, okay. adjectives not different than nouns, verbs different than nouns. So one thing to notice if you aren't familiar with categorical predictors is that it only shows me the two because I have three of them. So I get K minus one, which is two. And then um, you don't see noun. Well, that's because it's adjective versus noun and verb versus noun. So these are the differences in response latencies controlling for everything else um, for adjectives versus nouns. And that's not significant. Now, to interpret that, sometimes it's easier if I make a means table because these are categorical, so I could split them into groups and just look at the means. Now notice that they're not literally subtracted. So I, I said a second ago, adjectives versus nouns. This is the difference in the means. So if you come over here, you can tell that's not the literal difference in the means. That's because it's the difference in the means controlling for its length and um, frequency and the other compar comparison. Okay. If any of these things are correlated, um, these numbers are not the literal difference between means. It's the difference between the means controlling for everything. But I can still use T apply here to understand that relationship. So T apply is the dependent variable, then the independent variable, and then the function. Okay. Uh, I think you can also do this with tidyverse as kind of a like group by kind of thing. Um, so whichever flavor, but I'm looking at my means. I can tell that nouns are, are not different from adjectives in my analysis. Okay. Uh, they go a little faster, but nouns and verbs are different where nouns are longer than verbs. So I said earlier, I bet verbs are faster because there's less of them, right? And so uh, generally there's, there, there are more infrequent nouns than there are infrequent verbs. So I think these two things have are correlated together, um, but at the moment, I'm only looking at one of them. Okay. So verbs are usually read faster because uh, there's sort of less of them to pick from. Uh, and this is how I always interpret those kind of categorical predictors. The, the confusing part is obviously nouns and adjectives appear to be different, but after a statistically controlling for everything else, they're not. I can calculate some confidence intervals on those coefficients. Okay, the default for confidence intervals is 95% confidence interval, which is what we see here. Um, and this just helps me understand what the range of likely values for those slopes are. So for every one logistic unit in frequency, words are going to be speeded by 0.3 or 32 milliseconds to 25 milliseconds. So it just gives me a nice range of expected values. 
um, that are probable given the analysis we've run. To get practical importance though, what we're going to do is calculate PR squared. Now, uh, there's a library called CoCore. Uh, no, yes. Or is it PP core? It's PP core for part and partials correlations. Co core is comparing correlated correlations. PP core is for part and partials that will calculate partial squares, but it really does not like categorical variables. So I have always found it easier to just use this formula because it's an easy formula. Okay, so it's T divided by the square root of T squared plus degrees of freedom residual. And so I can actually hack that together using my R code here. So I've got my summary of my model, which is, and just show me the coefficients, which we actually used a second ago. So look at those coefficients. I'm going to tell it to drop the first line, because the first line is always the intercept, and I don't really care about the, there's no partial correlation for the intercept. And then I'm going to tell it to pull column three, because this is the row name, so one, two, three for my T values. And that's what this is doing here. Drop the intercept, only pull T, then um, T divided by the square root of T squared, plus model R degrees of freedom residual, and then square those, because we want PR squared. Otherwise, it's just the partial correlation. We want the proportion of variance. And what that does is now, kind of like using a standardized score, although I think taking a, a, a z-score of a logistic, a logged variable is very confusing personally, um, because now it's the standardized logistic score, which is weird. Um, now I can tell you which one of those variables was the most useful. And it's frequency. A big shock given the title of this lecture, right? But then link also contributes a, a lot to this analysis. So frequency is the biggest predictor, followed by link. And I can tell that our, our part of speech is not doing a lot after controlling for those. And so you'll see this on the homework where it talks about practical significance and how that is um, useful at elucidating which variable is the most important. Because I can't just use p-values. Right, so some people like to do this more significant sort of thing, where if the p-value is lower, that means it's more important, or if the t-value is higher, that means it's more important. It's really tricky um, because it sort of ignores um, the other variables. So instead, I would suggest using these partial correlations, which are the amount of variance accounted for after taking out everything else. So how much better am I than chance? <clears throat> if I know nothing about any of the data, the best prediction is the y-intercept. Right? So if I don't have a, a darned clue, um, the average of y is our best prediction. Um, and how much better than that am I? So when I add all of these predictors, um, am I doing better than just a random guess? And our F statistic represents um, the difference of that model from zero. So if I look at F statistic, I can see that it's 183. Uh, that's not necessarily the easiest way to look at it. So let's go back over here real quick. And non-normal data, summary, summary, summary. Do, do, do. Here, hit this button. And then R is going to do that thing where it acts annoying. Build the model. Summarize the model. Go. So when you're looking at the summary, the F statistic is the last line, and there's your, your p-value if you're interested. Okay. Um, so apparently, SciPen did not get turned off today. Now let's run that summary again. Okay. So now I can tell that this is less than 0.05. Okay. Um, so the overall model is better than our, uh, our average of Y. Okay. 
All right, cool. How practically useful is this model? And so R squared represents the overlap in variance. The options function? Uh, yeah, sure. So options here, side pen 999. Um, I swear I put it in the um, in the notes here, but I don't see it now. That turns off science. Oh, it's right here. It turns off scientific notation. So sometimes people have a hard time reading the p-values when they're this like uh, 2e to the negative 16, and they'll tell me, oh, that's not significant because it's 2. And I'm like, man, you need to go back and think about p because p-values can't be over 1. Right. Um, so if you have a hard time with interpreting um, scientific notation, you can just turn it off. You do have to do it every time you open R, unless there's some like parameter thing that I can fix in the background where it's always off. That would be beautiful. I'm sure there's a way. I just have never figured it out. It's never been too much for me to type. Right. No problem. Okay. So practically, how important is my model? So R squared represents the overlap between all of the IVs and the DV. It's essentially the correlation between predicted Y and actual Y. So the higher this number, the better we are at predicting people's scores. Now, 46% of the variance using psychological data is like, oh my God, I can't believe the world is ending. Somebody stop the presses. I have done magic. It's like voodoo. 46% um, in the business model may be terrible. So you kind of have to contextualize how good something is based on the field that you're working in. Um, so I work a lot with, I joke, I call them real doctors that, uh, because they have medical degrees. Um, and so 9% of the variance is a lot. 2% of the variance can be life-saving for people. So it just depends. If I got 2% of the variance, I'm like, well, that's not probably any better than um, throwing darts for our field, so whatever, but 46% is really good. So this model represents half, almost, of the variance in words is simply due to length and word frequency because we know that part of speech is not doing much for us. All right, so we've talked about building the model, assessing it for fit, so to speak, on both the predictors and the overall level, but I do need to check, make sure that the model fits the assumptions of this type of parametric test. So I have to mainly deal with outliers and um, parametric assumptions. So additivity, normality, linearity, and homoskedasticity. Homo okay. Let's start with outliers. Normally I would do my outlier analysis at the beginning, but there's actually a really handy package we're gonna talk about right now. Um, it's in the CAR library, C-A-R. And um, an outlier is a data point that has sort of undue influence on the data, meaning that the inclusion of that point changes the slope a lot, or they just have kind of an odd pattern of, of data points. Then we'll talk about independence, um, the DV being response, meaning that it is continuous, additivity, linearity, normality, and homoscedasticity is the big one. So starting with outliers, the hat values or leverage is how much influence the, a particular point has on the slope. So when I think about leverage, I think about uh, when you when your tire goes flat and you have to jack up your car and so you use uh, a jack and that gives you leverage to lift the car it's how much this car is lifting um, bonus points this library is called car <laughs> based on um, including the point versus not including the data point okay. studentized residuals are this z-score difference between our actual score and our real score and we standardize them to help us just see the distribution better because if the data are normal, the standardized scores are then normal. Then also we'll use Cook's values. Cook is a, is a measure of influence. 
um, meaning that it's both leverage and discrepancy. And discrepancy is just how far away it is from everybody else. Okay, so it's um, kind of like some in a new town, right? And I'm still trying to figure out where everything is. And we were talking about, oh, you know, the next town over is only a couple of miles, but it's a couple of miles on a 20 mile an hour road. So it feels really far because yes, it's four miles, but it's gonna take me 20 minutes between all those stop signs and stuff. So it's a measure of discrepancy, how far away it is. Not that New Jersey goes much better, <laughs> honestly. And to me, this is like one of the coolest plots that I have learned how to do recently. It's called an influence plot. And what we see is um, the hat values are leverage across the bottom. So everything to the far right is bad over here. The studentized residuals here are the um, standardized uh, E values. So anything at the very top or very bottom tends to be bad, especially four Z scores out. That's a lot. Okay. You want things between you want things to be between two and two. Then the size of the dot is cooks. Okay, so we've got all three values on here at once. And it's actually labeled the most influential points for us. So I told it to just print those out so I can look at what they are. And there's some weird words in here. So it's two adjectives and two nouns. They have very long response latencies, so they're at the top of the distribution. And they're weird words. Interdepartmental, how often do you see this word? <laughs> right. So all of them have very low frequencies. And two of them are long words and two of them are average length. Okay. But the word whip it is not something you see very often. So these words are just kind of the oddballs out. I could exclude them and try my analysis again, but I do know that those are real data points. So when it comes to excluding or including outliers, I always go with, um, usually if it's a very big analysis, I just like take them out and see what happens. Generally nothing, um, meaning it has a, you have a lot of data. Uh, if I know the data is real, meaning that that's the real uh, response latency for interdepartmental, I'll leave it in. If I think the data is suspect because a participant was just hitting seven the whole time, then I'll take it out. So it kind of depends on what um, type of data I think it is. The personal rules for using outliers. Okay, and that's the answer to that. Now, independence is a tricky one. Independence is this idea that each data point in the regression is separate from every other data point. So every data point is a different person. Here I've got person in quotes because the data points are words, but essentially I shouldn't have the same word in here twice. And I really shouldn't have compound words, right? So if I have um, butter and peanut butter, that might mess things up because those, while they're very different things, in the world, um, they have the same uh, word and compound word in them. I don't think, even if there are, there's 40,000 words in this data, so, you know. Um, and this is a small subset of the data, the actual data uh, available in the Arling library. Um, but I would wanna know that every point is different from every other point. Okay? And if they aren't, we have to do generally multi-level models. So you can still do linear regression, you just have to specify the correlated error because each point is now not different from every other point. Um, our data needs to be at least interval or response level. Check, it's continuous variable. The next assumption is additivity. So additivity is no multicollinearity. So I ask you if you have additivity, I'm asking you, is it okay? <laughs> So don't say, no, they're not correlated. It's like, that's not right. So multicollinearity is the problem. Additivity is the good thing. Okay? Because that means that each variable adds something to the equation. There are not two variables that are the same thing. That's where the term com comes from. And we really don't want any correlations between predictors above 0.9, or mathematically this might blow up. And then actually above 0.7 is where you get into what's called suppression. So the variables are your two loud friends in the same room that they're both talking super loud because they're so excited about whatever's going on and they're just shouting and you're like, 
that's the um, the math version of <laughs> the suppression is when it's two variables that are so highly correlated they're basically kind of canceling each other out. So I can show you the correlations. I excluded column one, which is the, um, I'm sorry, I excluded negative one, the dependent variable, because it only matters for the, between the independent variables. Okay, so I'm gonna ignore the intercept here. I'm gonna look at length, right? So none of these are that highly correlated. So I'm okay. I can also use VIF values. So a VIF score is variance inflation score. This is how much the addition or subtraction of the fee of the item uh, inflates variance. And it doesn't mean um, R squared. Like it's like how much it's like changing the, the error terms because once you start having super highly correlated variables, you'll see the standard errors start to do weird things. Um, and you want scores less than, I've seen the rule as five, I've also seen it as 10. So let's go with five because that's a more strict criterion. And VIF is the uh, inverse of tolerance, if you're familiar with tolerance scores. Uh, and mainly here, I just want my global representation of VIF, this first column, to be less than five. Okay. Check, we are good to go. For linearity, oops, I'm sorry, there's no text here. Um, there's a couple of ways to look at linearity. I like the QQ plot. Some people have learned that a QQ plot tells you normality. They kind of do both. Um, I think for, lin for linearity, this plot makes a lot of sense to me uh, because I wanna know if the dots line up on the line. Are they linear? <laughs> so here's a line, let's see if they connect, if they're on it, right? And we're gonna use the two to two rule for all of these plots. Are the dots close to the line between two and two? So between negative two and two. Why two to two? Um, this is all standardized. So that's two Z scores on either side of the mean. Everything past that in the tails, there's not a lot of data past two standard deviations. And so it can be really hard to predict. So yeah, it's unfortunate that out here on the end, past two standard deviations, it kind of curves away from the line, but it's not super um, unexpected to be able to, to not be able to predict as well where there's not as much data. And so this kind of plot, I would say looks fine because most of the data between two and two are on the line. Yes, it curves away, not a lot, not enough to want to switch type model types. For normality, I'm gonna make a histogram of the z-scored residuals. And I z-score them because they're just much easier to read. So I can use my two to two rule again. Is the data, data, okay. is the data centered uh, around zero and mostly between two to two? I have a little bit of positive skew out here because the data is centered around zero slightly to the left of zero. Um, most of the data is between two and two. I've got a small amount of positive skew. But I also have a crap ton of data in this analysis, so I'm probably okay. So remember with very large data sets, uh, normality becomes less of an issue because the central limit theorem sort of kicks in and allows us to um, assume that our estimates represent the, the larger population because the sampling distribution becomes normal. <laughs> now this bad boy, whew, this is not good. Okay. Um, so we're gonna look at homoscedasticity or, and or homogeneity. Homogeneity is that the variances are equal between groups, between variables. Homoscedasticity is that the variance along X and Y is equal for every point at Y. And it is not. Look at this. Look at this nonsense. So this is the automatic chart produced by LM. And you want the line to be straight, but I almost always ignore the line because sometimes it's misleading, aka your homework. <laughs> and I'm just looking at the dots. So if I look at these dots, I want them to be distributed evenly across the zero line. 
because um, this is the residual here. Now these are not standardized in this picture. They can be, I'll show you in a second. Um, but I want those dots to be a nice even spread across the line. I do not want any triangle shapes. I don't want any bulges. Check this out. This is like the muffin top, if you will, of, of dots. Don't do, that's not good. Uh, I used to joke uh, in one of my previous classes, no megaphones, no cheerleaders. So any kind of triangle shape um, or any kind of bulge in the data. And this is not good because the, the spread is definitely larger on one side than the other. I, this plot's great, but there's, there's two ways to do this. You can also plot it by calculating, excuse me, <clears throat> I've had way too much soda today, but it's, you know, 8 o'clock at night trying to teach class. <laughs> you can also do that by plotting the residuals, so I z-scored them, against the z-scored's fitted values. So we're plotting um, error against the actual y hat scores. And now I can use my two to two rule. So I want the data to be um, at least evenly spread. So it's four to four here. Uh, kind of not good because we have a lot of residuals, but um, it's not evenly spread across the bottom. And there's definitely a like a triangle shape to this. So uh, one reason that you get this sort of censoring where it's not anything below here on the left side is because response latencies literally have a lower limit. Okay, you cannot go below zero. You can't negatively respond like nobody's psychic okay, that we're aware of. Um, so that's one reason why this is happening. But in general, this is not an even spread across zero. Okay, so that's not good. And it doesn't matter which way you plot these, you still look at zero, the line for zero, and kind of look and see if it's evenly spread across the entire way. So I would say I have some heterogeneity or heteroscedasticity in this data set. And that's probably because there's another variable that I'm not including that actually accounts for that, but I just don't have it. And potential options might be bigram frequencies, so the frequencies of each pair of letters um it might be a pronunciation rule so words that are um consistent with sound spelling rules are generally a little bit faster so it might be a bunch of other a bunch of things that i'm just not aware of and in these scenarios there are a couple of things that we can do we can switch to non-parametric data um, as models or i can bootstrap so bootstrapping is where we will, um, it's, a, it's like the lottery if the lottery had replacement. So we're gonna build ourselves a function that will randomly sample from our data set and um, with replacement. And so we'll get a data set that looks like our data, it's the same size, but maybe participant number two or word number two is in there three times. Because the assumption in bootstrapping is that each data point in your data set represents one or more people in the world. Okay. And so I can say that, well, participant two can be in here six times because there are six participant twos in the world somewhere. So I'm going to build myself a function here. And you can copy this function actually exactly for the homework. Okay. The formula is the formula I'm going to use for my regression analysis. The name of the data. And then specifically for the boot library, the indices, the last um, argument here, is always the one you randomize on. So you can call this anything. You can call it cheese if you want, um, but it's the, la the last one is the one it's going to um, randomly sort your data with. So here in the function, I am taking that and just randomizing by row. So it scrambles the data set and then picks you know, the top 200 or whatever. Um, I'm running my linear model because that's when I want to bootstrap and I'm telling it give me the coefficients back so I can see if those coefficients are stable um, across many runs of the data because across a lot of these runs even if it's heteroscedastic I can kind of average lots of these runs together 
So to do that, I'm going to use the boot library to run these bootstraps. And this is lots of runs of randomly sampled data with replacement. And so I'm going to fill in the same uh, labels that I gave my statistic over here. So boot coefficient, it's formula and then data. So over here I've got formula, so it's our formula from earlier. The data set is ELP. The statistic is the name of the function we just wrote. I'm going to tell it to run a thousand times. Okay. So one note for the homework is that R here, which I don't know why it's R. <laughs> I wish it were like runs or something. <laughs> the number of random bootstrap samples has to be larger than the data set. So in the homework, the data set's like 13,000 rows. And so to save you from running 13,000 bootstraps, because that'll take like an hour on most normal computers, um, I have some code to kind of cheat. So we'll look at that in just a minute. And then I would tell it to print out the bootstrap. And the main thing I'm interested in here is this down here at the bottom. Um, this is the original statistic from our model. So those should match. If they don't match, you've done something wrong. Um, the bias here is a measure of kind of the, the, uh, the difference between your actual data and then the average of all of these runs. And there's actually a standard error on that as well. So you want these numbers to be small within the interpretation of the data. So if I think about this as milliseconds, right, and that range of milliseconds is like 400 to 1500, 12 points is not that much. Then I can also get it to give me the confidence interval for my bootstrap estimates. This is really what I'm interested in. So the confidence interval, generally people pick the normal one. There are a couple of other options as well. And you might get this error, and that's okay. Um, uh, the normal interval for which one do we do? Index equals 3. So I'm going to back up. How do I know what that is? The indexes are here. So 1, 2, 3. The third one was frequency. So this is the intercept, length, frequency, adjectives, and the verbs. They're in the same order as our model summary. And what we see is that this confidence interval pretty much encapsulates the same confidence interval that we got from the, the regression analysis. So I can kind of safely suggest that my regression analysis represents reality as I know it with this sample. Okay. So if your confidence interval for your bootstraps is very different than the estimate and confidence interval for your real data, that's when you have a problem. I can tell now that my heteroskedasticity is probably, it's probably due to some variable I don't have, but it's not a problem for my model, meaning it's not causing me some wild estimation problems. So I use bootstrapping to just kind of ensure that I'm presenting the best representation of the data. All right, so let's sum this up and then um, questions. Uh, I'll show you the homework and then you have questions about tonight's homework. Um, you learned about some really cool linguistic projects that you could potentially use for your final project. So the English lexicon project, the subtitle projects, and the um, semantic priming project. So we, we analyzed ELP for regression to predict response latencies. And then we looked at how we could look at the assumptions of linear regression. And then how to bootstrap just in case those assumptions aren't met. And so um, the beginning of the semester really here is starting as sort of, sort of traditional statistics. That's not going to last long. <laughs> so we're going to move into things you haven't seen before, probably starting next week with distinct, I think next week is distinctive co analysis.